Okay, so, so I think the next big lever is exercise. Sure. Uh, so yeah, what's your what are your thoughts on exercise? You know, there's a um, there. This is a this is an area that I think is uh, is interesting, um, and I think that exercise is a you know critically important element of uh, of longevity. But the question is how much, right? Um, there's a cardiologist by the name of uh, James O'Keefe who's done a, a number. Uh, he's done. He's written about this at, at length, and he, you know, he 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 writes about the quote unquote Goldilocks, uh, not too much, not too little um, amount of exercise for longevity. Because obviously, if you're exercising, it depends what you're exercising for, and there is exercising for longevity which is very different from exercising to run a marathon or, or, or for sport. His, um, his data um, that, that his writing suggests that sort of the minimal effective dose might be two and a half hours. So he talks about two and a half to five hours. I don't know if that's right or not. Two and a half sounds low to me, but Hey, I'm not the one doing the studies, right. Or, or, or uh, gathering the data. Um, the goal, the, the, what does seem interesting to me is that there is this sweet spot in that five hour to 10 hour range. Um, there may not be a significant amount of, uh, return after five hours to 10 hours. And then if, once you get to that 10 hour zone, now we're talking about rigorous exercise, rigorous mm -hmm. exercise, getting after, after 10 hours, there may be a reversal where, you may be counterproductive to longevity. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And it's not, it's not a problem for most of us to worry yeah. about, but for example, the, you know, uh, the, the data that he cites is in marathoners and ultra marathoners and, and things like that, where, um, uh, they tend to have higher incidences of atrial fibrillation, uh, cardiac fibrosis, and they tend to live, uh, uh less long than their counterparts. So, so it is interesting. There is a, there does appear to be an, a Goldilocks space. Now, in terms of the type of exercise, I think that the, the reason I think the two and a half hours is low is I think two and a half hours alone of what I would call a uh, level two cardiovascular exercise is, is what I would say is probably uh, the most important thing that you can do. And when you talk about level two cardiovascular exercise, I'm really talking about, um, so what is that? Uh, it's a 60 to 70% of maximum heart rate. Um, now, most people don't sit around and, you know, you know, count their heart rate uh, or, you know, try to uh, calibrate it just right with an exercise. So maybe the best way to think about it is you are uh, exercising and you can talk, but you're slightly out of breath and you certainly couldn't sing. That's level two exercise. So, um, to me, uh, you know, doing 30 minutes of a day of that most days of the week would be a significant value in that part. Remember cardiovascular disease is our number one killer, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about longevity and how to stay alive for the next 10 to 20 years. Let's cut to the chase. Let's cut out cardiovascular disease, which by the way, and we can get into if you'd like, but I'm, I'm of the mindset that no one uh, who doesn't, who currently does not have significant cardiovascular disease should die of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we just have too many, uh, too many arsenals um, for that to actually uh, be an issue. Um, so bottom line is, I think that that's the first thing, the, I would say two and a half hours of that, I'd say at least an hour of, of weight training of some type. And again, just trying to get, you know, this to be useful for people, think about doing some strenuous sort of weight, um, uh, weight exercise, uh, that, that hits all of your muscle groups once a week. That's the bare minimum, right? That's what we're trying to do. If you want to try to maintain, uh, your muscle tone as you get as you get older, you've got to weight train. And within an hour, typically, 
I think you can hit all your muscle groups. Um, so, and then in also I would say, yeah. So in terms of exercise, there's, and obviously there's flexibility, balance, uh, those types of things as well. Personally, what I find, uh, I'll tell you from my personal experience that the best kind of exercise, one of the most efficient types of exercise that I've personally found is hiking. Now I live in, uh, Southern California with some mountains around me in, in, in the Santa Barbara area. So it makes very steep mountains. Mm -hmm. And so being able to get that level two exercise while still, um, relying on, uh, you know, needing to, needing to navigate the rocks, um, you know, use your brain at the same time and, um, your balance, all of the, these things at once is, is very, very effective. So, and then finally, I guess, you know, trying to figure out some kind of dynamic, uh, flexibility program, at least for an hour a week is a good idea. Yes. Right. Yeah. The, the, the ability to react to change. Um, right. do, do you do any sports like uh, that, the, like tennis or anything like that? Do I do it now? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I, uh, occasionally play pickleball, uh, which is, a uh, something that's a newer sport around here. <laughs> Um, it's a sort of like, um, a, a ten, a mix between tennis and, uh, and, and, and ping pong. <laughs> wow. So that's okay. so an interesting sport, but, but I think that, yeah, doing things that require your, your mind during exercise or mm -hmm. of sig significant value. Yeah. Yeah. So actually it would be good to, uh, quickly dive into, uh, cardiovascular disease, like yes. so, so some of the levers that we have on that. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, if you think about, you know, when you, when I think about like the different things that can, um, that we're trying to avoid, remember once again, that our number one killer is cardiovascular disease, right? And I said earlier, and I will stand by it, that somebody who's, uh, currently doesn't have cardiovascular disease shouldn't die of it. And here's why. Um, we have all of the drugs we need already to prevent it. And we and, and if if it does, if you do have moderate disease, we have we have minimally invasive stents and that sort of thing. What we know is that that um, what we know is that there are a couple of components that really uh, that really cause cardiovascular disease. One of them uh, relates to your lipid profile. Obviously, I'm not even talking about some of the, the obvious things like smoking and, you know, staying away from the stuff that are obviously are very, very bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. But but if you're talking about a person who's, you know, living a relatively clean life, the things that are going to give you cardiovascular disease typically are related to your lipid profile, you know, your cholesterol, or, and the uh, systemic inflammation in your body, which I think, again, is grossly underappreciated. What we know is that if you look at um, uh, statins right now, if people stay on stat, if they can get on statins, if they need to lower their, their cholesterol, there's also other drugs that are uh, called uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, which can significantly lower uh, cholesterol. These things really are extremely powerful. And why is that important? Because what we know is like, if you have an apolipoprotein B level, you know, we're used to talking about, you know, when I went to med school, we used to just talk about LDLs and HDLs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But apolipoprotein B is effectively more encompassing of bad cholesterol or LDL. But if you have a, uh, if you can suppress that, down to, um, I believe it's uh, uh, 60, about uh, 60 milligrams per deciliter, then you effectively don't have the ability to create atherosclerosis in your body anymore. Hmm. So, and not only that, but there is anecdotal evidence and certainly some cardiologists in my area, you know, who I know, 
who are seeing this in their own offices and are treating aggressively, that there are certain levels of ultra low LDL levels, uh, apolipo B levels. For example, my my LDL, just so for perspective, because that's what most language most people speak, is 25. Wow. It's artificially lowered. And I'm doing that because when I was, um, I've never had, actually, I've never had hyperlipidemia. Uh, but I have a family history on my mother's side of some cardiovascular disease. So very early on, I was pretty, I was quite aggressive about this and had what was called a Cleary study that showed uh, some mild plaques. And the cardiologist I spoke to was very much into this sort of uh, offensive approach. Um, showed, told me basically that if you, if I'd lower my LDL to a certain level, he's seen plaque regression. Not only, not only do these plaques uh, stop growing, but they regress. Mm -hmm. And he's seen it in multiple patients. So that's why mine is, is suppressed as it is. So if you take that perspective, okay, not only can I stop progression if I keep my apolipoprotein, you know, uh, apolipoprotein B levels 60 below, 60 and below, but if I also am able to suppress it more, I might be able to reverse it. And if I get diseased, I can get stented. There isn't a whole lot of reason to die from cardiovascular disease anymore. Uh, I would argue that even with what we have right now, that we, we, cardiovascular disease is right now is the number one cause of death. It shouldn't be in the top 10. It's just that we don't treat it aggressively enough. You know, by the way, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is an underrated factor in cardiovascular disease. There was a study recently um, that showed that patients with cardiovascular disease um, they tracked what predicted, uh, you, you know, uh, what predicted cardiovascular death the most. And it wasn't, in fact, LDL levels. It was high sensitivity CRP, mm. which is an indicator for systemic inflammation. In particular, we use it for, you know, the, the, the whole cardiac inflammation issue. So that is another thing that I think that... Um, this is something that you see a little bit in the atrial fibrillation literature about trying to attack the high sensitivity CRP with colchicine of all things, which is an old, old gout drug. Mm. Um, but I have started taking low dose colchicine. Why? Because my HSCRP was mildly, mildly elevated for no particular reason. And I knocked it down way, way, way below no, uh, the uh, um, the low levels. Mm. So, In, interesting. I have not heard of colchicine. Right. Yeah, colchicine yeah. is is a really it's an old drug for gout. Yeah, yeah. So the studies on uh, in the atrial fibrillation literature that are on that, uh, I think we're uh, zero point five milligrams. Um, per day, right. it's low dose colchicine.